Everyone, let's welcome Jamie Flecknoe to Dragon Talk. Yay! Yay, Jamie! Thank you. Woo-hoo. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Let's give yourself a round of applause. Yes. You deserve it. For the work that you're doing, you deserve the applause. Thank Absolutely. You. Uh, so yeah, you are uh, doing tons of great stuff with role play lead uh, for everybody out there. What 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 would what would be your summary for for all the work that you've been doing with that? Wow, um, I work with teenagers eleven to seventeen, and we do social skill development through mostly Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. Um, so these are kids who some of them come in without any diagnoses, some of them come in. Uh, They're autistic, they have ADHD, depression, uh, anxiety. Um, Some of them are what maybe we would deem a little socially awkward in general. Um, They're not, I like to call, we like to call ourselves the indoor kids. Um, And these are just kids who love nerdy stuff. And some of them maybe have an interest in D&D, but haven't been able to find a group. Or uh, their parents saw this and think it fits into their realm of interest. And we go through campaigns that I create and we work on skill development and anxiety management. Wow. That is awesome. We hear so much about how Dungeons and Dragons helps that type of development, but what can you say about uh, being in a role playing situation? That's fun. That's about, you know, adventure and, and, and these wonderful fantasy stories that allows this, uh, this practice uh, and, 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 you know, this honing of social skills you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, Assuming most of our viewers have watched, have played a little D&D in their life. I mean, in and of itself, the game is kind of structured for this um, this this bit of chance. So life, a lot of the struggles that the kids that I work with come up against is when life doesn't go their way, when they have a plan in their head and then... Uh, the teacher doesn't, the teacher changes an assignment or the kid that they're working with maybe has a different idea than they do. Or, you know, their parent asks them to do something that they're, they don't want to do. They plan on playing video games for the night or whatever the case might be. And so the really cool part of D&D, of course, is that D20. You can in your head say, I'm going to do this. And then, yep. And then you roll your D20 and it doesn't roll the way you want it to, right? You can't complete that goal. And so um, that allows us to really have these conversations about what is your character thinking right now as they planned on doing, moving this boulder out of the way and they were unable to do it. Why are they distracted? Why are they stressed? And then we start to translate all of that stuff into real life. Like, what was it like when you um, prepared for your test, got into a fight with your sibling in the morning, and now you're distracted when you're trying to take your test? How is that affecting you? And how do you um, come up with another plan. How do you ask for help from a party member or a teacher, you know, and then translate that to teacher or friend or parent. Um, and so you add in then this role playing and you start to watch as uh, the kids are amazing. They start to support each other. And so in the beginnings, I get to do that, right? Like I play the DM and I play like an NPC or I'm the voice of calm and reason maybe. And then they start to do that for each other. And it becomes really beautiful. It's I, okay, I need to preface this interview <laughs> with, like, these are my favorite. I love these stories about, you know, people using D&D in these really positive, unique ways. So I will either spend this entire interview just staring at you with this, like, bless your heart expression <laughs> on my face, or I'm just going to pepper you with, like, question after question after question. I think it's going to be the latter, because um, I've already, <laughs> like, written down, like, four Post-it notes filled with questions. But, um, I'm okay, first one. If they if they try to do something in the game and they do not succeed, do you give them? Do you ask them? Well, why do you think you didn't succeed? Or do you say like, oh, you tripped on your way to, uh, you know, do the sneak attack and they heard you? But is is that part of of using D and D in therapy is to to ask them those those questions about why do you think this didn't turn out the way you wanted it to? Yeah, I mean, it definitely depends on the situation. Like if they're all just rolling. My each of my groups are at a different spot. So I have one group that has been with me for this is going to be their second full year. Um, like this summer will be two years that the group has mostly been together. Wow. A couple of kids have moved in and out, um, but the core group has stayed together. And that, that group I get to really dig in with, right? Like if somebody rolls a one on a stealth check, I get to be like, what's your character thinking about that they didn't realize that they were 
you know, tripping. Um, and so, yeah, so in those cases, I definitely will say like um, these, and to preface that particular group that we just started a campaign last summer and we'll be finishing it this summer. And we did like session zeros. We built in backstories. Like the, these characters are entrenched in the world. So um I can ask their characters and themselves a lot deeper questions because they're more entrenched into the world. And so we'll talk about like, oh, you just discovered that your father is actually, a, you know, doing this. And this is like caused all of these problems, like this big ripple effect within the country that you're all living in, um, within the realm. And we can really dig in and then relate that to things that they're feeling personally. Um, and then we have groups that I call mini adventure sessions. And these are just four weeks. There's an adventure that we go on for, you know, four weeks for an hour and a half each week. And in those groups, we get to more talk about that's more focused on very specifics like teamwork and communication. So like if something breaks down, if they get into a battle and somebody goes unconscious, afterwards we talk about like what happened, like what was the breakdown in the communication versus like really, really digging in um, because they just come in, uh, they come in with different needs, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does. Yeah. And I think one of the the things that D&D is really good at is teaching you how to fail. At, and I mean, that's such an important life skill, but even learning like not all failure is bad. Like, you know, it, it can either be a teachable moment or it can be an opportunity to help someone or for to learn how to accept help from someone else. So I, I think I can see that being an important tool in the work that you're doing as well. Yeah, it's a huge piece of it. And, and uh, we also talk about failing doesn't mean that you're done. It doesn't mean that there is no more opportunity to succeed. It might mean you need to like literally level up, like practice whatever it is yeah. you're doing and get better at it because you can't take a dragon on when you're, you know, you can't take on an adult dragon when you're all at level five, you're all going to die really fast. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you can't come back later when you level up. Um, and the same goes for an opportunity to, you know, get information from somebody. So what, you roll low on your persuasion check on this particular moment, but that doesn't mean A, another party member can't help you, or B, that you can't come back to this or acquire this information from another source, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny. I mean, uh, uh, parenting is full of moments like this uh, and just... 20 minutes before this interview started, my, my, my nine-year-old was, was working on a sewing machine project and she messed it up and she was very upset because it was the last bit of material that she had and she tried four times and it messed up. And I was like, you just need to, to, to keep going. Like, it, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person or that anything, you know, I get it that it's frustrating and I would be, you know, crying too in that frustrating moment. But, you know, here it is, you just got to practice and, 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 and level up and get another ch chance to do it. And it's those type of things that D and D provides almost inherently that makes it magical, and you don't even realize that you're learning these things sometimes, right? So your work is a lot about like, oh, it is about realizing and and, and talking about those 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 growth moments. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I get to what's cool about my role versus you as a parent, which is unfortunate for parents everywhere, mm -hmm. is that I can play a whole bunch of NPCs and I can, like I can side teach lessons as like my one one of my groups jokes that I like always pull the like family therapist in when the group starts to fall apart. Like I'll just put a random NPC in. But like you know, sometimes not all parents have this experience or teachers or whatever role you're playing. Um, but it's easy, it's easier, air quotes, to hear a lesson from like a random nobody in your campaign than sometimes it is from a mom or a dad or an aunt or, you know, a, a teacher or something like that. So yeah. I kind of get this opportunity to, to, to have those moments um, with a really cool voice and, you know, I get to give myself a cool accent or something. What kind of like parenting. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a great idea. I'm thinking like I actually do have some NPCs that I work into my parenting repertoire. Like we have like the um the bad moms. There's several of them that sometimes will be invoked if um you know things aren't going well. Uh oh. I wonder if, uh -oh. I wonder if he's gonna turn that around in <laughs> you in later years. We have a witch character that actually my mom used to um pull out with me that I was like I'm going to bring her out now. Like, I feel like it's just going to get passed down. Her name is Fiddly Boozoo. Ooh. Um, she, was, she was terrifying as a child to me. Uh, my mom would just, and I realize now, I'm like, oh, I think she was just doing this because she just wanted us to leave her alone. Like she would just be like cooking dinner, 
do, do, do. And my brother and I would be like, ma'am, 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 ma'am. And then she would turn around and she would say, I'm not your mom. I'm fiddly boozoo. And then we would run out of the room. <laughs> oh, my God. This is why you like hacks so much, Shelly. It is. It totally is. Fiddly boozoo. It's all coming like, together. It is. <laughs> Yeah, so I I do think that parents can have there's opportunity there to do a little <laughs> and bring some NPCs into your your uh, parenting world. Why not? Yeah, um, yeah, that's yeah, and that's it's it's amazing. It's fun to get to do that kind of stuff with them. Yeah, but so why do you think? Because we, like Greg said, we've we've heard um, some. You know, of our other guests talk about similar things and how using D and D and role playing games in general can really help with these types of situations. What is it about it that you think makes it work? Is it like just having the right amount of disassociation between you and your character that you just it just gives you a freedom to try and fail or like what 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 is it? a huge part of it. I mean, in the research for people who are who are in this field of like applied role playing games or therapeutic gaming, um, is this concept of like if you think of if you think of yourself and your character as like two circles of a Venn diagram, you know, you have all of this outside stuff that doesn't overlap, but there are these moments where you overlap a little bit, and it's in that space where you can start to. Uh, explore, you know, so the distance part is great or the parts that don't overlap. So it's kind of fun. Like, hey, if you're really shy, I have one of my kids who's really, really shy and um, they're playing a bard in this oh. particular campaign. And it's it's fun because there are moments where they'll say to me, like, my character is way more charming than I am or way better with words than I am. And I said, that's OK. Like, take a deep breath. Let's try. Like, I'm still going to let you roll a persuasion check or whatever performance check for it. Um but I still want you to try to approach this person and lead the converse, you know, approach this and lead the conversation. And so there are those moments where you don't overlap at all, right? Where your charisma, <laughs> your in-game stat of charisma is way higher than your out-of-game stat of charisma, but you get to practice. You get to practice what it's like to build confidence, to say the air quotes again, wrong thing, um, and still survive and still come back, come out alive on the other side. Um and then there are those moments where you do overlap, where you might be having this particular struggle. I, I had a, I have, I have a student who is going through a lot right now personally, and um, one of the things that they were going through was this like overwhelming anxiety, just can't sleep, can't eat, can't focus. And I and I would say to them, tell me what you would say to your character if your character approaches you with all of the same problems that you're having right now. What advice would you offer your character? And then what advice would your character offer you? And so we kind of start to look at, um, well, my character's more put together than I am in this way. So they would say this to me. And I say, okay, that sounds like great advice. You both, you you fidget when you're nervous and you love to color to express anxiety. You love to do art. Why aren't you doing more art? Like, let's talk about what that might look like for you. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there is that beautiful line where our character's Listen, I've been playing D&D for a bit now. I've never made a character less awesome than myself. My <laughs> characters are always fantastic. Like, they're different than me, but they're way more cool. Like, they, they can do way cooler things than I can do, right? And so it's kind of this moment of, like, all right, your character is amazing. Where do you overlap with that amazing, right? Where, where can you find and draw in those experiences? And then you're amazing. Where can you bonus those things that you're awesome at and give them to your character in their time of struggle? Oh, so that's kind that's of for beautiful. me where I like, love that. yeah, often I run um, spring break, like I run camps all like breaks and, and summer and, and, and all, all school breaks. And at the end of it, I always say to them, what's one piece of advice that you learned? Like, what's one thing that you learned during this that you would like to tell your character about? And what's one thing that your character learned during this that you would like them to like tell you about? So we kind of like find that middle ground. I love that. It's like a self-actualization in a way, right? Where you're like, uh, you know, this is where I want to be and how am I going to get there? But it's your D&D character telling you <laughs> how, to, yeah. how, to, how, to, how, to, how to, you know, take the fact that you can shoot a bow and, and, and the confidence that that gives and uh, uh, apply it to your life. That's it's fantastic. So you mentioned that you've been playing D&D for a long time. What was your, what was your first experience? Not what was your or Not super long. <laughs> <laughs> Long, longer than I planned on being. How's that sound? Um, my well, first experience playing D&D &D was incredibly awful. 
It was fun. It was so fun. But it was one of those experiences that you look back on now that you know more and you're like, Mm. oh, that was a train wreck. Um, My husband, by the way. Yeah, (laughs) right. Like my husband's best friends from high school came to visit us. Uh, We don't live near them anymore. So they came out to visit us. And uh, the one, one of them sort of knew how to play D and D five E and we were like, listen, we do everything else that's nerdy. Like we've done all of the other nerdy things. This is the next logical step for us. And so uh, we were like, can you teach us while you're out here? And we got a uh, Fandelver and started playing it. One of them was like a wizard, a wizard who just like cast grease whenever he wanted. We were all like falling all over the place. There was like a a war between the paladin and the wizard. Like uh, uh, they were like color spray was used a lot. Again, like that was like a self-fighting color spray thing on each other. Um, some poor goblin got roped into the party and dragged around, cast friends on him. It was just, it was like one of those things where you're like, look back and you go, is there a plot to this? Or are we just goofing around and, and, and stuff. Um, but even in that moment, I realized that there was something really special about the story you could tell if you were maybe gathered with people who wanted to tell a story. And so we started searching for a group, a local group, and we've been playing with them ever since we are going on year four. Oh, nice. Together. Cool. How did you find that local group? Meetup. Oh, Uh, nice. Okay. Yeah. We just put a meetup out there, and uh, the first time I forgot to, like, put an age range on it, not to say that you can't play with people who are much older than you, but we just got, like, a bunch of of, of, of people who who were like, we're going to play D&D 3, like 3.5, and I was like, I don't know that one. Can we do 5? <laughs> um, and so then we, like, re-reached out, and now we've, we've been playing with almost the same people for this whole time. Some have come and gone, but... Um, it's been like they're my best friends out here. They've helped us move. They've, uh, it's been fantastic. D and D does that for people. You rolled high on your persuasion check to get them mm-hmm. to help you move. I guess. Huh? <laughs> I brought, I brought beer and pizza. So, hey, so that's works. with advantage. That's right there. that's rolling yeah. with advantage right there. <laughs> so, beer and pizza. I feel like we got yeah. I feel like we did roll well. That's so awesome. at no role playing isn't necessarily new to therapy. I mean. It's, mm-hmm. Drama therapy has been around for a long time. Like you, that role playing is kind of like the old stereotype of you know therapy. But when, at what point did you realize that this was something that you could use in therapy in your practice? Yeah. Um, so I have this. I have this really pretty piece of paper that says I have a master's degree in leadership development, <laughs> and um, through that program, I learned a lot about how we. Um, I learned a lot about the stuff we process inside. So like uh, when we're experiencing any type of emotion, how it's like a trigger and, and all of this and this stuff. And, and through that, um, I kind of began to realize as I started playing D&D that the same stuff comes up for our characters, right? When we get put in a particular situation, we get triggered, happy, sad, angry, whatever the emotion is. And then we react on it. And it's particularly interesting in D&D because... Um, oftentimes the way we react in D&D, we feel like there's no real consequences because technically there's not, right? There's no real world, real world consequences for how we act. So there's some, for some people that barrier goes down pretty quick and they're quick to react no matter what the, whether it's positive or negative or somewhere in between. And I started realizing that these are things that I had studied. These were, these were things that I had practiced and learned how to manage within my real life that I was a lot quicker to put aside as I started playing the game and really starting to experience the emotion. And um, I started to think, uh, so I also uh, worked with teenage, with um, post, my my master's degrees in leadership development and higher education. So I was working with a lot of like freshmen in, in college who are basically seniors plus four months. And so in doing that, I started to realize that there, there were a lot of opportunities to start looking at those triggers. There are a lot of opportunities. I mean, again, we've talked about how the game is collaborative. The game requires you to communicate with people, requires you to listen. And so all of that was already built in. And then there were these role-playing moments, as you brought up, Shelley, these opportunities to really dig in deeper. And I thought, oh my gosh, like, this is perfect. If I had this when I was a kid, I don't think I would, like, I think my life would have been way more fun. Um, because going to therapy for me as a kid 
um, was, was helpful. Don't get me wrong, but you know, you're just sitting across from somebody and telling them your stuff for the most part. And not to say, and just to be very clear, I do social skill development, not necessarily necessarily therapy. There are people in the field who do it specifically for therapy, but there were these really cool opportunities that I saw for the skill development. And so I kind of just decided I was going to give it a go. I reached out to some other organizations that had already been doing this work in other parts of the country. And I was like, hey, what what do I get to do? Like, where's my part in this? And we talked about leadership development. And here we are. Nice. Every D&D party needs a leader. So there's yeah. Uh, yeah. And like the too. nice thing about it is that I love to tell parents who are willing to listen and people who are willing to listen that leaders don't always have to be the ones who are like in charge, right? The decision makers, you know, everybody plays a role. If you think of any D&D party, there's some sort of role that you're playing, whether you're the one who plans everything, whether you're the one who's tired of everybody planning everything and you finally move the story forward, whether you're the one who talks to everybody. So uh, kind of recognizing that within the kids as well, right? Like everybody brings something special to the table. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I think, you know, having these conversations always makes me go back and look at, oh, experiences that I had uh, growing up. And I was uh, certainly a... Um, I don't know, I guess problem child for some teachers as they always said that, oh, you know, the, the kids just listen to you and will do whatever you tell them to do in the, in the guise of having fun, right? And that's disruptive when I'm trying to teach, so please don't do that anymore. And I never really got that. And now I'm realizing some in my, in, as a player in a D&D party, I'm, I'm in many cases the instigator, not necessarily the leader or like the moral center or anything, but I'm just the person <laughs> who gets the story moving and will do the action that will... Uh, you know, let the story unfold. And I, I didn't make this connection until just now, but that's probably what my teachers were telling me back in the day was was that quality. Yeah. And, and, and it's great. Yeah, and it's great to know that about yourself too. That And that is something that I think this game does allow those discussions that you wouldn't even think about or consider without... Uh, you know, a having those experiences of playing through the game, but then also having someone like you to talk through and be like, okay, this might this might be what this means, and 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 that, and that's super valuable for anyone, um, especially when they're in those formative years. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we also forget, right? Like that kids, we 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 teach kids play, like we teach kids through play up into a certain age, and then all of a sudden, like late middle school or like done with play. Like that's not something you engage in any longer as a, as a learning tool. And so if you don't end up being on a sports team um, and learning about teamwork in that way or some sort of other group activity, um, when do you learn about communication? And some kids don't necessarily learn about all of that even if they are on, a, you know, on some sort of team. Um, and so, you know, a, a handful of the kids who I who I've worked with very much just needed other people to remind them that like you can be kind or listen or share your or build up confidence and share your ideas. You know, you don't have to be always quiet. You don't always have to be the one who talks. You know, whatever the case may be. So, yeah, yeah. I'm curious what kind of characters you see them these kids gravitate towards like when they're creating they create their own characters I would imagine is that part of or yes. do you okay and then are you because it seems like we are either trying to play someone who is very very different from who we are or we're just like the really awesome version of ourselves but what do you what what do they do do you find that their characters often are embodying qualities that you see in these in the kids in real life or are they trying to play like just superstar rock star characters that can do anything uh it definitely depends on the kid um for my group that's on year two my intention was for them to play characters who were a little different than themselves because where I push them a little harder. Um, and so that happens. Um, but for the most part, they will start out with characters who are more like them and then realize that they need to fill gaps, right? So um, you'll have a party of nobody plays the healer. Why? No one ever plays the healer. So you have a party of like 
tanks basically and you know whatever whatever rate or whatever class but they'll pick a tank and then you quickly realize that, like somebody has to fill in that blank so they'll swap out their character or they'll multi-class into a cleric or something like that for some healing powers um so you start to see them change as they play longer they start to realize that uh not everyone can sit there silently and stare at each other and wait for another person to make a decision. Somebody is going to have to speak up. Um, you start to see one of my favorite things, especially with completely new people to D&D, with kids who are new to D&D, is when they don't realize that like the world is built around them and lives even when they're not part of it. So they'll go and like attack a farmer's cow and then the farmer is mad at them because they don't have a cow anymore and so you start to like real and then they're like oh shoot like I'm affecting this person's life I need to think before I act now and so uh, you know you tell them that in the beginning but then they still go and attack the cow and you're like well now that kid had like that family has no food for the next six months or something like that um and so then they begin to adjust how their character behaves based on on how the world is. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they are. Sometimes you get a group of kids who like to push boundaries. That's the best way to describe it. Yeah. And then we impose like God punishment to them. Like they are cursed You for as like, long as it takes for them to start doing acts of kindness. Um, and oh. so like, the, yeah, like, you know, a God will punish them. And then all of a sudden as they do nice things, the punishment lessens and lessens until they're back. Um, well, that's a really interesting way to, to yeah. teach morality. Uh, uh, Some groups really need that extra moment of like, not only does this cow, you killing this cow mean that there's no food for all of these people, but also then when you attacked this or just walked out of the town and like left it, uh, the God of that town is upset with you now because you have not taken into consideration anyone else's feelings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another good parenting tactic too. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't have kids myself, but I've heard good things. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is something where I'm like, well, you know, you screwed up and you now are paying the price and you'll never do that again. Or at least, you know, you'll, yep. you'll, you'll have that thought go through your brain uh, about all of that. And that's, I mean, that's something that has come up around Dungeons and Dragons, but also video games and things like that over over many decades, right, where parents are like, well, why would we have these murder simulators or, 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 or things like, uh, um, you know, the satanic panic and stuff about D&D uh, &D back in the day was that it's, you know, it's, it's teaching, it's allowing you to do these things. And the part that was always missing from those arguments was what you just described, which was like, no, it's, you're not in a immoral universe. Like, you're not in this, like, you know, the whole point is that you're, you're, you're doing good. You're you're accomplishing a quest. You're you're, you're doing something um, that is meaningful for the community that you're in. And almost every story that's told in video games and Dungeons and Dragons, and so it is a a, a a teachable moment. Pretty much every story that's told, like like Grimm's fairy tales, like you know the parables in the Bible. If you want, if you're a religious person, right? Like there's all those things that there. And if you're not letting the um, children and even adults experience that those consequences uh, in, a, in a way that's safe, right? Like, that's what we want. Games provide that. And D&D &D especially is a way where you can be like, well, no, here's, I mean, you know, the, the example you just described about, about uh, uh, you know, t killing a cow. It's like, that's going to be something that hopefully gets ingrained in their brain and they'll learn it because they experienced it, not because they were told by their authority figure. Yes. I um, recently-ish published a module through Roleplay Lead that runs like a D&D game, but has these social skill moments built in and then like a whole appendix about uh, how, to, how to be a social skills DM or how to use these moments. And um, one of the big ones is that for every action, like there's a ripple effect, good or bad. So in one of my campaigns, um, uh, the rogue who lived on the street for many years met a young girl who like was struggling and gave her some gold, right? And so there will be a positive ripple effect from that eventually as they come back around to it, just as there is uh, a negative ripple effect for 
stealing. Um, I had in that campaign that we published, I had one kid who tried to steal from the innkeeper who literally um, like has a, uh, what I'm looking for, like a soup kitchen-esque type of line for anyone in her town who needs food. And stealing from them means that like stealing from the inn means that there is no more extra food to give out to the town's people it means that they might not be able to like cover their rent and, and stay there. And so I don't know what, you know, it's not always as dramatic, but like there is always something you can't just steal from an innkeeper and then leave. Like there will be an effect when you come back to the space again. That's you know, this I don't is, know it's you. It's very much the, the whole, the old adage show don't tell, like, you know, and Brian, like you don't, you're not just telling someone like you cannot steal. It is bad. Like you're actually showing them through their, through actions that, that they now have to role play and they have to, as their characters, see the consequences of what they've done to this town and the people who now don't have a meal to eat, which is on the very side. powerful. Yeah. And it's, it's, it is. And then on the flip side of that, because I'm, I mean, I sound like I might, my kids are all terrible, but they are really great kids. <laughs> on the flip side no. of that, um, you know, that same campaign went on for a really long time and um, gods were coming, you know, gods are coming up and being freed from their prison. And because there was a group that like, they were so good, they had all of these allies that they could pull from to help them manage the hordes of like other army, you know, the armies that these people, uh, these gods brought with them. And so, you know, it's great to kind of watch that because, you know, I think, I think it's pretty there. I think it's pretty safe to say that the negative things that often happen to us happen faster than the good things. Like you plant those seeds and it takes a lot longer for the good ones to like really grow, mm -hmm. but it was so beautiful to watch them be able to like call on, you know, the dwarves from this city and them saying, yeah, we'll, we'll guard this and we'll watch this area and the druids from this grove. And they're like, yeah, we're in, we're going to help you. Um, and being able to say like, great job. You guys did amazing making all these allies and leaving really good impressions in all of these little groups that you've, you know, seen as you've traveled around this continent. Like, great job. <laughs> yeah. You reap what you sow. Yeah. So it's, uh, it was, it was really fun to watch that happen. Well, that's well, kind of one of the, oh, sorry, Greg. I told this is going to be like <laughs> rapid fire. Yeah, no, do it. <laughs> that one of the the things on on your website, uh, you talk about the concept of bleed, which again we have we've talked to some of our other guests about this the idea, um, where in the way that you describe it, it, says some of their real life issues will bleed into their characters, um, but also that concept can go both ways in that the things that happen in your game can bleed. And like, if you have a really successful, amazing experience, then you might feel a little more, ha you know, happier in your, your life after the game. But I'm curious about, because sometimes things don't go that way in the game and you can have, you know, something bad can happen to your character or to the party, or you didn't succeed at something. And, then you could have a, maybe a carry a negative feeling into your day to day. And I'm just yeah. wondering because of the the children that you're working with, some of them do struggle with anxiety and, and depression. Is that something that you have to always be mindful of as the the dungeon master? Like, do you kind of, do you just let things happen be, or do you kind of keep it on rails a little to protect them from having the negativity follow them into their real life? That is a really great question, Shelley. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I want to say it depends, and I'll give you an example. Um, when I have a brand new group, like newish, beginner or intermediate kids, particularly ones that I've never worked with before. And when we get to an area where somebody goes down or something like that, particularly in a group where even if you do pick a cleric, I think at like level three, you get, well, like three spells, three first level spells. It's nothing too, too exciting. And a group of people who don't know how to navigate combat. And I never let anyone die. Um, there's always a God that will intervene and say like, Hey, we're on the same path. Like I want this to happen. You know, I want you to succeed at this and breathes life back into them and lets them go. Um, so I always, I always like preface it. Like, you're not going to die. Don't worry. Like, Take a deep breath. We're going to work through the role-playing moment of what it's like to be dead and what it's like to have a god come down and talk to you. But in the end, like your character is not going to be dead. As we get further along, though, either if no one has changed to a cleric or 
picked up Druid or bought a thousand healing spells, I begin to get a little bit more, um, They're dying for reasons that they are not working together. I will let them die. I'm not going to lie to you. I will wow. let them get to that moment because um, if a group is, if a group, and this is like my contingency, if the group has been together for long enough that they know how to battle, they know what a battle in- looks like and, and entails, and they know each other's abilities, and somebody still falls unconscious and fails their death saves or whatever the case might be, then. I will let that happen. For example, um, my one group was in the Underdark moving around and they came across a lava river with a fire elemental in it. And it was just wide enough and the way the river was shaped that my monk wanted to like punch the fire elemental. And I was like, here's the deal. You're right on the edge of that, um, like the river. So I'm going to make you make a dexterity check to see how well you balance before you punch, or you can roll at disadvantage. I was like, if you want to roll straight, you have to make a dex check because you're not paying attention to where your footing is, or you can roll at disadvantage and pay attention to where your footing is and not to worry. And they said to me, I would like to roll regular, made a dex check. It was like a three or four or something very low. 18 D 10 damage fell right into the lava submerged dead. Like oh, outright dead killed. 18 D10. That is a lot. Yeah. That's what happens when you submerge yourself in lava. <laughs> <laughs> I had to look up the rules because I had no idea. I was like, what happens when you fall in lava? Like 5 D6, 18 D10. Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, and then I think lived through that, but nobody could reach him. Like nobody could reach the character at that time. And then I rolled another 18 D10 for the second round that they were in there and they died. Oh my God. And so, well, and so this was, and this, in this particular student, the lesson is this has always been for this student that they like to um, just do, like, do not think. Their character one time cast, but I don't know, fire, like one of the bolts that goes straight and does a ton of damage at a high level uh, in a different campaign as like a wizard and killed another character who was in the line of that. I was like, you know that that goes straight and hits everything that's in this line. He goes, yep, I'm going to do it. Like, and killed another character. Oosh. So we start to talk and that is his lesson, right? Like is to learn that there are consequences. And if you're not going, you know, these are the, these are the things you deal with. But I also knew we had revivify on hand. So that was another thing. So we were able to revivify him and bring him back. Um, we had an issue with a dragon. They wanted to go in. They, I did not, I made it obvious. It was a giant dragon skull, like enter in the, it into a cave. And they're like, we're going to keep walking. And I was like, mm-hmm. all righty. And then we all made stealth checks and we had the clunky armored one roll really low. And the dragon clearly heard them. And they, none of them rolled high enough on their perception checks to notice that it was a dragon layer. And it Oof. like it hit them with their dragon's breath. And three of them went down right then and there. And so like, it was interesting. So I let them get anxious, right? Because they know I will let them die in this particular group. But I let them talk their way out. If everyone from the group offered something important to the dragon and made persuasion checks with advantage, the dragon would let them cast magic and walk away. And so then it was interesting because one of the kids was like, I don't have anything to offer. Like, Literally my character doesn't have anything on them. And one of the other players was like, well, you can paint. What if you painted a mural of this dragon's like finest moment for him? And that was awesome. The dragon was like, oh my God, yeah, I'd love like that dragon skull out there. Let me tell you about how I killed that dragon and paint that for me. And so like we had that moment of, of like having them work together. That just sounds like good storytelling, too. Like, that's what's so great. Like, what you're describing could happen in any, uh, you know, amazing Dungeon Master moment. And it's, that's what I love about your work is that, like, you know, you're you're hyper focused on it and 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 using it in ways that helps, uh, uh, you know, the children develop these skills. But so many players of Dungeons and Dragons are just getting this through play. Uh, yeah. and understanding some of these moments. And, uh, you know, that's that's amazing. It well, really the, is. And the other piece of it is that I have Discord set up for the kids. Like, I have a private Discord server. And um, I will leave my, like, my DMs are open for them to message me. So after that dragon fight, the one, one of the players almost died. Well, they were trying to figure out what that other player could offer. And so they reached out to me and they were like, I was really anxious about this. My character is going to carry this. Like, how do I, you know, is this a safe way to express the feelings? And one of the things that they said to me was like, 
Well, my character almost died there and then they fell down a mine shaft and no one, the bird flew to the bottom and didn't catch them. It was a moment. Um, and so the one who like morphed into a bird, it was interesting. And so they said to me, like, my character's really upset. No one's asked me how I'm doing. And I was mm. like, that is interesting. I was like, but think about it this way. When that one character died from the lava, no one, and like died, died, not just failed a couple of death saves, but like all of them, hmm. no one checked in with that character. I was like, I think we as players, even outside of my work, we assume you're going to fall unconscious, right? I never check in with any of my, like in my own group, I never check in with any of the players who fall unconscious. I'm like, okay, you like, you fall unconscious. I healed you, like you're done. So I was like, I think it would be awesome for you as a player. And this is one of my older kids in this group. And I was like, to reach out and say like, hey, why don't we check in on each other after we fall unconscious? That's scary. Like I'm scared for my life all the time when we walk around and do stuff. I'm like, how does that affect your character? It's like, you know, so we have these, I still engage with the students even after class often, particularly in our groups where storytelling is heavy. That's smart. That's smart. And that's, again, that's smart for every dungeon master out there. I think mm -hmm. that's become a lot more of the conversation recently about, you know, how, uh, situations can be traumatic, uh, perhaps unknowing to the dungeon master or, or other players in there and having those open lines of communication. And technology does this so well now by having those, those Discord channels and things that can be uh, you know, privately messaged so you're not necessarily disrupting the flow of the game but can just check in on people. And uh, that's, that's great. Great advice. Yeah. Um, yeah. As I've been taking sips of my uh, coffee, I keep thinking <laughs> about your, your podcast, uh, Sip oh, Happens. Yeah. Uh, and how awesome that, uh, of a title that is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, my friend, uh, Sean, I don't know if y'all know him, Sean Banerjee, they are fantastic. Um, and we both met through uh, some other work that we did and started talking about our love for tea and then started this in this like detailed coded out uh, Excel document where we were just, we would drink teas and then rate them on there. And then we were both like, well, what if we like had a show where we drink tea, rate it, and then bring on some RPG person and they talk about their RPG stuff and we drink tea together. <laughs> and we just, before we recorded this, we sat down, we have 26, we are, we are covered until like the second week of August. We have enough. Oh my God. And or already recorded. We reached out to people and we we're like, no one's going to want to go. Like we haven't even recorded an episode yet. Who's going to want to come on this show with us? People are like, yeah, that sounds like fun. And all of a sudden, like all these people we reached out to were like, yeah, we'll be there. That sounds great. <laughs> I think we're booked through like halfway through the year. Wow, that is amazing. Tea. Yeah, there's something about tea in the, yes. in, the in the TRPG uh, community. Uh. Uh, Lisa Penrose uh, from uh, you know for, former community manager here at D and D started uh, you know the D and D community show you know and it's very similar. But I, I love that idea of of a casual conversation that can lead to so many other, you know, fun, uh, exploratory yeah. things. It's, it's great. Yeah. It has been an experience, uh, in learning how to produce shows and <laughs> edit. And again, I don't really edit them. I just put them into it, like drop them into my video editor. And I'm like, I'm not editing anything out. So of one episode, Sean got like too close to the T and snorted some. And I was like, that's going to stay. Oh yeah. <laughs> Those are the moments. That's Those golden. Good moments. Totally. Yeah. So uh, it's been an interesting but fun learning experience for us. And we've had some really cool people come on and tell us about what they do in the world and um, how they're helping, you know, make D&D &D grow and become, you know, and all the RPGs out there. Like just how do they contribute to them? So it's been fun. It's yeah. very cool. Yeah. Um, speaking of things that are very cool, TED Talks are really cool. And you've done a TED Talk. I have. Tell us about your TED Talk. Yeah. Um, it was this. Like I talked about, I talked about very specifically. So the, um, so Ted's whole thing is uh, ideals worth spreading. So what's your idea worth spreading? And mine is that we can, there are other ways that we can teach teens skill development, social skill development, anxiety management using D&D. &D. And so I got to talk for uh, about 11 minutes on stage during a pandemic. We have one week away from being stuck doing it online. Um, so wow. we did it to an empty audience. There was no one except for the film crew there. Um, but we still got to be on the actual stage, which was really nice. Um, and yeah, I, I, there were, our, my specific one was uh, during the women's um, 
week. So all around the world, all women were talking about their ideas worth spreading. So I got to be in a group with other amazing women. And yeah, we just talked about a lot of what I just shared with you all, different examples. Like one example of a student who's actually now one of my teen DMs, but started with me struggled through this idea of learning about how to be wrong, how to sit in their anxiety, um, was leaving the classroom four to five times a week um, because they were having such bad anxiety and working with others or dealing with a teacher or something like that. And after about a half a year with us, they were down to once a month leaving due to their anxiety. And I am now on their senior capstone project and they're bringing D&D to their high school. So they have a D&D club now in their oh high school. Um, so it's been really, really fun to watch that student evolve from, a, from an amazing teenager who didn't like when somebody had a different idea than they did or challenged them to this DM who I trust with, you know, beginner students. Uh, running campaigns and then bringing bringing D&D to their high school. So are you, I was going to ask about if any of the students end up becoming dungeon masters themselves and it, are you giving them, because I'm, I'm guessing that, and I think even in your Twitter bio, you refer to yourself as a social skills dungeon master. So is, is it, are you, when you're training up these new dungeon masters, are you training them in a specific way so that they aren't, you know, they're recognizing situations in the game where they can insert some teachable moments and all that. Is that exactly. that's part of, okay. Yep. They'll sit with me. We go through, um, they sit on the sidelines for a while um, as I teach, taking notes and asking questions about moments. Um, and then I'll ask if a difficult moment appears, I say to them, I'm like, Hey, Shelly, tell me what you would do in this particular situation if it were you. And they'll we'll walk through what that would have looked like for them. Um, I have a series of, of documents that they have them read through as well. And then We'll switch, they, they'll DM and I'll sit on the sidelines. And then we kind of go through all the difficult moments that they come across or moments where they weren't sure if they did the right thing or whatever the case might be. And then I set them free. We I let them do what they need to and we'll check in. So we check in what situations are you facing in your, in your class right now? Is there a particular issue? Uh, what ideas do you have for it? And then we kind of build from there. That's that's really cool. And I like I, that is an, an amazing success story. Anxiety is one that's, um, it just seems like it, it's so prevalent in kids mm -hmm. and especially young kids. And I don't know if it always was. And I just didn't notice because I didn't have a kid and I didn't have a <laughs> lot of friends that have kids. But it seems like everyone I know is struggling with some form of, of anxiety, even before the, the pandemic. But it's a... It's such a tricky one to um, to, to deal with, and I th I'm I'm struggling a little bit with with my own anxiety, but also with um, I I recognize it. I see it in my son. Like he he can get spun up pretty quickly, and like it's either I have to try to figure out what is it that you're truly being anxious about because you're projecting it on the wind you know like he'll just be like right. it's, it's windy outside and I think a tree is gonna fall a tree is falling on our house I'm like that's never happened like we've never ex seen, even seen a tree that has fallen what is the the real thing um yeah. but also like learning because you're gonna have it no matter what it, it always it's just really getting those tools in your toolbox so that when you feel it coming and how do you manage it and I'm trying yeah. to think as you're like talking how in D and D do you acquire those tools specifically to deal with things that you're like you're just gonna have? It's just gonna be part yeah. of your life. How do you how do you deal with this? Yeah, um, there's a couple of ways that I work on it with the with um, my students. One of them is again like learning how to ask for help. So when you feel anxiety coming on, you don't have to go at it alone. You have friends, you know, at your table. Uh, you have me. You have family. So kind of like learning how to just how does your character ask for help when they need, you know, when they can't move that boulder out of the way, you ask for help. So same thing should apply when you have anxiety. Um, and then what's been really, really, I, I didn't anticipate this, but love it nonetheless. Um, all of the kids have taken on some form of creativity through D&D, &D, writing backstories, writing their own campaigns, uh, art, they draw their characters, you know, I mean, how many of us have 7,000 characters that are sitting mm -hmm. disused on the side? So there's art for all of those characters. Um, and um, learning how to advocate for themselves. So I have 
I'm going to tell one really sappy story because I'm really proud of it. I have one student, like I said, who'd been going through a lot and I have created a really wonderful relationship with that student. And they, I was the first one that they told that they were coming out as non-binary. Um, so I was like the first person to sit with them and talk with them through all of that. So building those relationships where a student can come to you um, when they're having that anxiety. And then again, kind of like working through what does that look like? And so I kind of always refer back to these, these moments where anxiety is absolutely part of our lives. When is it so much that you need help? When is it something that you've, like you were saying, kind of spun yourself up about and you can just write? Can you write, tell me a little story about that. Write it down for me. Uh, I do, you know, again, with my Discord, I'll do things where I do creative writing contests and um, like I'll give out a set of dice that I have for like, you know, anyone who writes one or will vote on, you know, different categories and stuff. So I think part of it is watching the expansion of it from the D&D table of just your characters learning how to ask for help to you learning how to ask for help to figuring out what you like to do to, to expend your anxiety. So again, is it the writing? Is it the art? Is it um, creating a campaign? I, I, I can't tell you how many kids have come up to me and said, I'm DMing this weekend for the first time. Like, this is the little one shot that I wrote. What do you think about it? Oh. And so it's been, all of that are great ways that I've watched these kids kind of go from, super anxious or shy or whatever words you would want to put there to describe uh, something that seems a little bit non-social to these ways that they've become creative within themselves and then experience that with, the, with their different groups. Yes. Build that confidence up, right? Yeah. Like that's, I mean, especially in middle school and early high school, like that is so important and i wish i you know as you said like i wish we had this yeah. when we were children yeah. uh and i mean it, it existed for sure but there was all that weird stigma around it and i'm so glad that you know the work that you're doing as well as you know the visibility of dungeons and dragons in you know in streaming as well as uh you know talking through mental health uh is is you know finally losing some of that stigma as well and so all these factors together i'm hoping that you know, you're planting the seeds for 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 D and D to help people. You know, decades to come. Yeah, here's hoping. It's a great tool. It's such a it's such a great space. Yeah, yeah. you can teach a person to fish, but you're teaching them D and D, and that's I think more valuable. I yeah, agree. Because you can fish in D and D just fine. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. Roll that roll that D twenty and get that trout. That's all you need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the exactly. the uh, the module you wrote is that the the new queen's handmaiden is that mm -hmm. and that's the one that has built in um, social skill kind of development challenges for lack of a better yeah word. yeah there's just moments where like I'll introduce an NPC or a moment and then off to the side I'll say like this is why this person or moment is here and here's how so you cool. can capitalize on it um, yeah that's is great. that available like can anyone access that. Drive through RPG. You oh. can look it up or you can go to my website. Role Play Lead has a link to it. Um, and you can buy it. All the proceeds from it go towards me probably buying dice for the students. Or uh, once we go back in person, I got spell cards. I have a whole bunch of spell cards I can't wait to use. Um, but yeah, all the money goes back right into Role Play Lead and, and, and funding the work that we do. That's awesome. It's important work. Yeah. Yep. It's been really fun. It was so fun writing that. I was really lucky. All right, yeah. well, look that up. And then uh, you said yeah. your website, Role Play Lead. Uh, what are some other uh, avenues where people can get in touch with you or tell stories about, you know, their growth or, you know, their their students or kids developing these types of things? Twitter. Twitter is my place. I'm almost always on it. I'm uh, Rosie, R-O-S-E, underscore games. Um, and I talk about all kinds of D&D &D and my puppies. Oh, nice. my two are, favorite things. Are, right. D&D &D and puppies, really all you need in like <laughs> NT. Um, but yeah, I talk about all kinds of stuff on there. I do have a role play lead Twitter account. You're welcome to follow it. But I do a lot more on my own stuff there because my parents are mostly on other forms of social media. I also have Facebook. Um, we're doing uh, virtual classes and camps all summer. So there are in-person and virtual camps. So if you have a kid somewhere out there, no matter where they are, if they have access to the internet, they're welcome to join us. Um, we'll be offering virtual classes going forward now because uh, it's been so successful. Oh, that's, that's amazing. great. Yeah, that's yeah. smart, especially with, I mean, people are now going to be transitioning into going into schools right. a lot. And yeah. then, but that's still going to be hard, right? There's still going to be so much that they won't be yeah. able to do. And so having that play 
uh, element is uh, super important when they don't have that recess moment to to develop those social skills. So that's that's really great. I think yeah. people take yeah. advantage of it. I might do it honestly. Yeah. So we, I'm looking kids. at making an older. Yeah, we could bring them on, and I'm looking at making an older group because now a lot of my kids are getting to that age where they're like graduating, and they're like, "Well, what are we gonna do now?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I guess I <laughs> now have enough of you that I could do like an 18 plus, you know, like an 18 to 22 group. Put I me, guess. put me in the 18 plus 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 group. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can do that. We'll, we'll make that group for us. Uh, you know, an, an even older group. I could definitely amazing adults. That's yes, awesome. I could definitely use it. Um, Roleplaylead.org, right, for that Dot website. Org, yeah. Okay, And there's a lot of really good information on there as well. So Yeah, please come check it out. There's all kinds of ways uh, you can learn about what we do, which is so fun. Awesome. Well, That's thank so you so cool. much uh, for coming on, Jamie. This has been wonderful. I love hearing about these stories as, as Shelly uh, you know, we. I, it's, I got. It's, I mean, so many post it now. So <laughs> we might I think have we to have you. All, right? We might have to have you or... have you on again. <laughs> Absolutely. <Darn. laughs> we'll make it happen. Uh, thank you, Jamie, and you know, keep doing amazing work and letting kids roll with advantage because I think that's what you're doing here. Thank you so much.